in mind, I want to lift up just a few developments over the last couple weeks. First is that uh, the Wesleyan Covenant Association has issued some statements over the last couple of weeks. The first one is to stop paying apportionments and put those monies in escrow. So that's from a, uh, an article put out on August 12th called Let Our People Go. And then the second is a moratorium, uh, ending the moratorium on filing charges on liberal clergy who don't obey the Book of Discipline. And so that came out a week later on the 18th in an article called The Moratorium is Over. So I'm going to be speaking with my guests here in a minute but uh, about this and, and how we should feel about this. But both of these uh, uh, articles talk about changing the covenant relationship between conservative churches and the denomination as a whole. Now, this follows on the heels of, of several decades of tension between conservatives and the institution as a whole. Many decades of, of individual churches withholding apportionments, many decades of individual churches and Methodists filing charges against others. It has been a most unpleasant journey. Um, is it something that glorifies God? Is it something that is a reflection of Methodist discipline or not? Um, so this is, this is something to reflect on. The, the, in the WCA was formed as an advocacy coalition group aimed at changing the temperature within the denomination. And is this something that's helpful for them to do, or is this something... The WCA has now urged conservative churches that um, feel trapped no longer to give apportionments to the denomination. And the language, you know, there's clear disciplinary language that all United Methodist churches are, I mean, one of their first responsibilities is paying apportionments. It's just a clear sign of covenant faithfulness. And um, to, many, uh, to many people, this seems like outright hypocrisy whenever conservatives are screaming, you guys are being unfaithful to the covenant. We have a shared covenant. You guys are not obeying. For us to then answer in kind and say, well, we're not going to obey the covenant either. Um, is that what's going on here? Yeah, so a um, couple thoughts on that, um, and and let's start with the WCA statement uh, to do that is focused on a couple conferences that have been uh, extremely punitive for the conservative churches trying to leave. Um, what I would say, and if you're not aware, I, I currently serve as the vice president of the WCA, newly elected to that position. Uh, I was a charter member of the WCA back in 2016 when they launched. I filled out my paperwork to be a charter member. Um, because I believe in in providing strong support for our conservative churches and and, and members that uh, want to see an orthodoxy return to the church, and so that's you know from the Oklahoma WCA stance, um, we have a conference that is for the most part working with us, mm -hmm. trying to trying to help conservative churches leave that feel they need to leave the denomination, but if you travel over to Arkansas mm -hmm. and you're a conservative church. Uh, the uh, bishop there and the uh, board of trustees, uh, they charge you a 50% excise tax on your church property to leave. Mm. So if you have a $2 million property, they want a million dollars on top of the exit fees that are required for pension liability uh, and uh, um, apportionments that are spelled out in the two, 2553 uh, provision. So there are some conferences where the bishops are not acting. And, and the hope is, is that the protocol would have passed in 2020. So when you talk about the protocol, yep. that is the protocol for peaceful separate. What, what, what was the full uh, title for that? Boy, it's a mouthful. It was a separation, a protocol for separation through grace and something else. Nice. Something else. Yes. Nice. It was put together by a, a, a lawyer, not a Methodist yeah. Jewish guy, that felt sorry for us, and he mm -hmm. got together all of our different constituency coalition yep. reps, yep. left and right and middle. Yep. What are the conditions under which we could separate and not have hard feelings? And we came up with an arrangement, yep. which was to everybody's liking, which we at General Conference 2020 would have probably approved. However, COVID came. Yep. We had to cancel, cancel again the following year. Over that time, we had more and more falling out. Finally, the left-leaning groups withdrew their support a few months ago. Right. Looks as though it doesn't really have much of a chance at this coming up general conference. So if the protocol had passed, all would have gone well. It looks like the protocol is now donezo. Well, when they withdrew their support, that was one of the things that led to the Global Methodist Church finally saying, okay, we're going to start this thing. Yes. We're not going to wait on general conference anymore. We're just going to do it. Yep. And so um, the idea from the Wesley Covenant 
perspective is that the, the protocol was gracious mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, an opportunity for us to bless each other and say, hey, you go be in ministry, we'll go be in ministry. God will bless both of our ministries. Let's just not hurt each other anymore. Yeah. And we were at a point of, of hurt. We were we were hurtful to each Still other. Still there. Yeah. Our language is not good for each other. General Conference 2019. Oh, it was icky. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. I was there. Oh, I didn't know that. You yeah. went to. Oh man. Yeah. Made it a priority to go. I'd not been to General Conference before. I'd followed General Conference since about 2012, I guess, when everything that got passed didn't pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I made General Conference. I've tried to be a part of it online, worshiping. Uh, the worship service, every every aspect of it, try to be engaged, uh, just to educate myself. And so, 2019, that was historic, and so I just wanted to be present and be a part of that. And so that, you weren't a voting rep; you were nope. just okay. No, nope, just went as an observer in the gallery. You're just a good Methodist. Uh, well, I was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was chaos. Yeah, it was horrible. The language was horrible. Mm. Uh, you know, Africa just had uh, Ebola outbreak, and so someone stands up and equates the traditional plan to, uh, you know... A disease. A disease, yeah. yeah. And, it's going to kill us, yeah. going to kill us. And That was it, Tom Berlin. I'll call him out by <laughs> name. He did that. It was it was sad. It was sad to see how... Karen Nicholas, uh, tied to the WCA here, mm -hmm. she wrote up a full account of what happened at 2019 and all of the the really abysmal, disgusting things that happened there. Yeah. Really, and, and yes, the temperature has gone down since then, but we've gotten even more entrenched, and yes. the hurt is still happening. Yeah. It's just a prolonged. I mean, it's like it's like there's a cancer eating away at us, and we're we're going through chemo, and and we're just slowly dying. It's just terrible. Yeah, it, it's really unbearable. So, so your position is that the WCA is 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 providing a touchstone for a transition to happen here, and whether or not the problem is within our annual conference, it is approach that needs to be used across the whole connection. No, no. No, you, no. you would say only within those annual conferences. That's exactly okay. right. And in fact, the WCA put out uh, a list of annual conferences that were not acting within the uh, spirit of the protocol. It's like 19 of them, right? 19 of yeah. them. And uh, and so the idea is, is those 19 are, are causing harm to the conservative churches that are trying to leave. So yeah. this is their way of uh, combating that. Again, in Oklahoma, we've had um, a pretty uh, congenial relationship with, with the conference, uh, bishop, um, and so they're providing, they're providing a means for us to exit that's not overly punitive. Some people would say the fees are really high and, and a high bar to reach. The uh, percentage of vote for a local church to exit is high, uh, but that's all spelled out in the, in the paragraph 2553 that they're using for the exit. And so in Oklahoma, uh, we wouldn't encourage the withholding of abortion. Now the the uh, overall WCA has said to for all annual conferences withhold the Episcopal fund uh, as a way to... That's the fund that pays the salaries of all of our bishops. Yeah, Many conservatives are of the mind that the Council of Bishops has been especially hostile to conservative interests in the denomination. And so there needs to be a, a response to that. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a language of what's in the paragraph, but there's also this thing of just conscience and ethics and faithfulness. And one of the things that really just sticks in the craw of a lot of people is we have discerned that we don't want to be in this covenant relationship anymore. We don't want in. Uh -huh. And you're standing between us and freedom saying, give us some money or we're going to take everything from you. And at that point, there, there does, it, it, it raises a question of how do we maintain the impression that this is a Christian organization when we're treating each other this way? And when the only response is, well, hey, this is what's in the discipline. You know, when we're hiding behind a legalistic approach to language that we created, you would expect that, that people of, of conscience and love would say, I know what's in the book of discipline but I'm not going to stand between you and your freedom. I'm not going to take that money that was put in the offering plate for mission in your local church and throw it at a, 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 a denom or at, a, at an annual conference that is going to hurt you if you, you don't. That, yeah. Something about that just really feels icky. And a lot of people in the pews, you know, the clergy, we've just learned to deal with it. We've just learned this is it's, normal, this is what nature, we do. Yeah. But a lot of people in the pews, they hear about it and they go, how is this right? Right. How on earth can you justify this? And there's... I haven't heard any responses from conference officials that really answer that on the same wavelength. 
Yeah. Um, a lot of it has been, well, we started these things together, and if you're going to leave, then you need to finish this through. And there's not an acknowledgement of, you've actually been funding this for decades. <laughs> you, know? right. you have been doing that, and because you've been faithful, we're going to say yeah. goodbye now. There, there, it, it feels like a bad faith thing, and the, the confusing thing is the people on the other side don't have bad intentions. Mm -hmm. So how do we have this deep disagreement where it feels so obviously mm -hmm. disrespectful and dishonoring of Christ when, when that is not the intent at all? It's just one of these warped things. But you're of the mind that, that in Oklahoma it's really not called for to withhold apportionments right. at this point. And then does the the more ending the moratorium on charges does that also apply in Oklahoma? Yeah, let me let me back up to that uh, just a second. So the um, the unfunded pension liability is probably the biggest dollar amount that the church has to take yeah. care of, and what that is uh, from from my perspective, it's right that we help the clergy who are retiring have retirement put it in place. the The challenge is is that some believe on the conservative side when those calculations are put together, it's like doomsday Armageddon. The market completely yeah. crashes, and yes. this is going to everybody lives for a past hundred. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there's been some negotiations that have gone on that that are really more favorable to the idea that okay, if those monies aren't used, they'll be returned. So the latest uh, agreement, disaffiliation agreement, uh, twenty, I think it's a ten year window. So if West Path who is our retirement uh, organization, changes... They're uh, the ones handling our money. Handling yeah. our money for our retired clergy. If they change the way they do business or or they recast a different model uh, between... If you disaffiliate as a church uh, this October and in six years from now they re recalculate that and it's different, your money's in escrow. They're only using the actual monies needed to pay for pensions. And so that money's then refunded back to the local church. Yeah. Now, that doesn't help on the front end of getting out. But yeah, it, as it, it is right now, but at least, there is no way to pay over time or pay later. It's all up front. It's all up front. Pay all this money up front. That's right. Which is usually about five times your annual uh, apportionment rate, I think, five to six times. Yeah, it's, it's a high dollar amount. But the, the beauty of that is that's something that's taken place over time with the idea that, um, you know, before it was, well, where's this money going to be kept? Yeah. How are they going to spend this money? Yeah. Is it only going for pensions? Yeah. Or can they spend it for survivability of the Whatever. conference? Yeah. Right. And so we feel, I feel, that it's been a transition toward trying to come up with a comparable agreement so that uh, it's not uh, punitive mm -hmm. as much as possible. Still feels punitive for some of those churches that that's an absorbent, absorbent amount of money. That's still tough for them. Uh, but I think it's shows at least good faith on our conference's part that they're trying to figure out how to make it in a, make it happen in a way that is still fair to all. And we have to realize um, the United Methodist Church is not going to be anything what it looks like right now. Churches are leaving. Consider you, considerable amount of churches are, are leaving and deciding to leave. You talked about budget. We'll talk about that here in a minute. I know you're going to get to that. But uh, the conference is planning for what's it going to look like when... X amount of percent of budget is gone. Yeah. How are we going to survive? Rather than raising taxes, <laughs> right? To, Apportionments, to, yeah. To, to keep the, uh, to ship keep, to keep the, the ship afloat, uh, they're having the conversations. I was in a meeting yesterday. I'm on the denominational transition team, uh, which is the group that is helping put the policies in place to help look the procedures in place mm -hmm. so that churches wanting to exit can exit. Um, you know, that conversation was up. They're, they're trying to finalize this before annual conference in October because they've got to put a budget forward. And so they're looking at a drastic reduction in the, in the budget without raising apportionments on the local churches. So there's a big picture where they're trying to accomplish several things, and I can't imagine all the moving parts no. to, to that. I don't know that anybody there's, has there's, room for that in their brain. There's so much it's going a huge, on. Huge shift. It's a huge thing to to take place because it'll no longer look the way it looked before. Well, and it's not like it looks now like it did 15, 20 years ago. I mean, it's it's we used to be one in three Americans used to be a Methodist, right? We used to be majority when we put out statements. It used to be in the paper the next day. That's right. You know, a general conference made big resolutions. Washington D.C. listened, and our laws, in some sense 
often reflected the sentiment of the Methodist. We have seen a huge loss of face yeah. um, going back to Prohibition, and then all after that, um, very few institutions actually stay the same over time. And for some reason, we feel entitled to that, but we shouldn't. Right. Um, so there, there has to be an openness to uh, death and new life. There also has to be an openness to, and I don't hear liberals or conservatives saying this. I wish I heard. I would hear more people say. It, I guess it sounds defeatist, but I need more people to say, God might not be with us. Mm. Um, I know that I feel I have a calling. I know that I feel I'm on God's side, but the fruit does not seem to be here. Right. Is, is it at all possible that we have jettisoned something essential? Is it, all po- is it at all possible that we have majored in the minors mm. or that we have uh, not held up the standard in the banner? So anyway, you can tell where my sentiments are. Let's hit the moratorium. You're of the mind that, that apportionments need to continue to be paid in conferences where the conference leadership has seemed to be generally amenable to, to helping churches get out under 2553 without too big a, a hurdle. With the moratorium, the moratorium was pronounced with the, the, the protocol, while we have this, this peaceful separation in mind, let's, you know, we, yes, we have a, a lesbian bishop that the Judicial Council said should not be in place. Yes, we have entire jurisdictions and annual conferences who've said they're not going to obey the discipline. Yes, we have many clergy within almost every annual conference who have refused to abide by the strictures of sexual morality spelled out there, and who often also preach things inimical to classical Christian doctrine in, in, a, in a number of other ways. Yes, we have all that. Don't talk about it. Don't press charges. Don't insist on the purity of the body or in uh, common shared discipline. That's now over, according to the WCA. Now, game on. If you guys want to play hardball, we're going to call out a spade. We're going to talk about heresy where it's preached. We're going to talk about sexual immorality where it's practiced. Is that a different thing from the apportionments, or is that also uh, something that accountability should that only be practiced in conferences where they're making it hard for conservatives to get out? I would say the moratorium should have never been put in place, right? The reason we're in the shape we're in is because we've absolutely ignored the rules that we have put in place. So why continue down a destructive path? Church after church that I've served, I've walked in the door, and I just hear person after person who's left this church mm-hmm. because we don't follow the, the, the discipline that we've set out for our churches. So I would say um, the moratorium, uh, it should, should not be in effect. Why, why, would, why would we allow, um, why would we, if, if we're not going to allow for this graceful way for us to go our separate paths, why would we not adhere to the rules that we have set before us? Follow the rules, and those are the rules. So if they want to change those in 2024, they can change those in 2024. But in 2019, and I get sick of the, well, it was just a small majority. I don't care if it was a small majority. When you look at like any voting system, any two-party voting system, that's actually a big majority. Right. When, when you look at the U.S. Senate, when you look at it, it's actually a, a sizable margin. Yeah. Even so, at 2019, they not only maintained the standards that we had, but actually made them firmer. Yeah, they increased some uh, penalties for clergy that performed same-sex weddings, uh, they, uh, which is like mandatory suspensions without pay. Uh, so if you're going to violate the discipline in this area, this is mandatory. So to people like me and you, what has seemed to be, the clear picture seems to be people on the ground local salt of the earth United Methodists across the world and within the United uh, States have generally preferred a traditionalist conservative stance to the Bible and sexual ethics. And the only reason we've had the sacrimony is because of uh, people seeking and gaining power at the top levels of our our denomination who exercise their authority to um, cause discontent. Yeah. Um, and I would and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And uh, you said earlier uh, that you know laity is more conservative than the clergy, right? And uh, you know the the sad part for clergy is um, I saw a Facebook post the other day on one of the popular clergy pages, and and literally the person admitted, well, I knew that the United Methodist Church didn't really have the beliefs I did, but I knew that once I got in, I could I could work to change those. Openly said, in other words. We took the clergy person took their covenantal vows to say, "I will teach, 
believe in mm -hmm. and uphold our discipline. Basically, what they're saying is that what they really said is, well, I hear what you're saying, but I don't buy it, and I want to change it. Yeah, John Lomparis wrote uh, an article on uh, this that I actually caught some heat for whenever I reposted it on Facebook, but saying that our denomination would not be in this mess had people been honest mm. and just not taken those vows, but that, that we had such a massive number of people who wanted to be clergy who were willing to lie about whether or not they believed that the discipline was in line with the scriptures and whether or not they were going to enforce and defend it. Um, and there are a number of people that I've known over the years who I've made that point and they've taken issue with that, but I haven't heard a way in which that's not true. Right. Well, and, and uh, when laity asked me about it, well, you know, how do they get away with it? Well, they don't say it publicly. They don't stand in a pulpit on Sunday morning and say that they question the virgin birth mm -hmm. or uh, some do. John Shelby Spong, some you know, will. We, some will. We yeah. find bold, some yeah. bold enough to do that. But but overall, they know that the laity are more conservative, and so they know that they can't stand in a pulpit and say some of the things they actually believe. Right. If I couldn't stand in my pulpit and say the things that I actually believe, that would be living a lie to me, mm -hmm. and it would go totally against my moral code to do that. So. Again, I go back to a profession versus a calling. Right. You know, if if you truly are called and you're passionate about Jesus and you're passionate about uh, bringing transformation to people's lives, you will tell the truth of what you believe. Yeah. If you have to hide what you believe, then there's something else there. And so that's what happens is these clergy serve in churches and they 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 won't tell it to the laity because the laity will run them out of the church. Yeah, yeah. They want people that believe and what And rightfully. We believe. You know, I mean, this is the hard thing, is when you're talking about conflict is actually good. When we're talking about ending the moratorium and people now filing charges on clergy that are not in conformity with the discipline, what a lot of people automatically feel is hatred. You know, this is a hateful thing. This is a, And from our theological disposition, it sounds dishonest to people who don't agree with us, but we actually see it as the most loving thing in the world to exercise church discipline Absolutely. upon people who are not in conformity with it. Because what we see is a, a very pitiful person living in dishonesty, having entered an entire way of life in dishonesty and practicing it day in, day out, and the way that that must warp them on the inside mm -hmm. to be this um, devices, divisive, subversive character in an organization that has made room for them is evil. Mm -hmm. we would see. And that's pretty strong language, but in that case, the most loving thing to do is to shine a light on that dark place. Now, it's not going to be received that way. It's not going to be felt that way. It might not even look that way to most eyes, but people like you and I would genuinely believe Jesus sees it that way. Well, it's, it's if you have kids, you've ever had kids, or you've been around people that have kids, or you've, you've supervised kids, when the kid reaches for the hot stove, the loving thing to do is grab the kid, mm -hmm. and pull them back. Don't touch that. Yep. that that'll hurt. The, the loving thing... Well, change the metaphor, not even just for a child. Pretend you have a friend over, and he's about to lean over on the stove. Don't do he, that. He's an equal with you. You yeah. know, when we're looking at other clergy, we're not saying, oh, these poor children. Oh, yeah, we're yeah, going, yeah. I, These people are equal to me. Right. Or even a higher ranking. I still don't desire that they would burn, you know? <laughs> But, but from God's perspective, us, yes. us as His children... I understand now, yes. You know, God doesn't want bad for us. No. God's well, a holy God. The Lord disciplines the one whom He loves. Right. The Scripture says it flat out several times. And so the, so the idea that me telling someone the truth of the Scripture is hateful or hurtful or bigoted is really missing the bigger picture. Yeah. True love is not saying, do what you want because I love you, to let you do what you want. True love is saying, hey, this is what you're doing, but this is what Scripture says, and I just want you to know that. Mm -hmm. Now, you can still go do that. Yeah, you're you free, got the to free do it. You got the free choice, the free will to do that, yeah. but you need to know really what Scripture says about that yes. and how that plays out. To me, that's love. And so I think we have a competing uh, definition of love. Absolutely, and absolutely. Because, and we live in a relative society, Everything's relative. So how it feels to me yeah. is how our society lives. And and that's not what the church is called to. The church. Yeah, we're, we're called to objective. Mm -hmm. 
not subjective. We believe we're called to truth, we not believe, my truth, God's truth. Yeah, absolute truth. We believe in absolute truth, and God. So is when I thought about truth. sitting down with you, I thought about doing the culture war thing of, can you tell me what a woman is? What is a woman? <laughs> I thought about saying, do you believe in absolute truth? Yes. You know, because as you sit down and figure out who you're going to have a conversation with, I think these are things that, on a uh, basic level, are dividing people right now. Do you believe in truth with a capital T? Or do you only believe in subjective truth? Yeah. Do you believe that identity is something that you negotiate with people around you or something that is already within you and you get to say what it is? These are foundational issues about how we communicate and are in relationship with one another. We want to brush over it, act like it's not there, but it's what's undergirding everything. It is. Right now.